Here's an interesting post by Stupid Eyes Me. Jean Benet had bits of the Ramsey's own sparkly stairway Christmas garland in her hair. The Ramseys refused to cooperate with the police. They made no attempt to use their multi-million dollar fortune to catch the real killer, a lot like OJ. The Ramseys finally went on CNN or some news show with a small poster offering a $100,000 reward if Jean Benet's killer was caught, nearly $20,000 less than John's Christmas bonus. Access Graphics had passed the $1 billion sales mark. In the early 90s, the Ramseys spent $700,000 just to build the third-story master suite on their mansion. I don't recall ever seeing a poster or billboard about catching Jean Benet's killer that was put up anywhere. I don't even recall seeing a photo of one that was actually put up in public in Colorado. When the Ramseys went on TV and held up the small poster, it was a bizarre performance. Patsy was loopy on drugs. John had a very cold, often contemptuous glean in his eyes when he occasionally glanced at his drugged up wife during her slurring of words. He frequently purses his lips and looks uncomfortable to be near her and even angry as she goes on with her hold your babies close, someone is out there. A couple of years later, the Ramseys canceled the reward for catching JonBenet's killer. Why, when the money was just sitting in the bank anyway? Huh. I mean, interesting questions. All right, let's continue on here. Another post by Comical Akim Asimok. Just what exactly happened to Bill McReynolds' daughter? They never found any suspects, question mark. According to the, this was actually only a couple months ago, according to the Daily Camera, the rec, McReynolds' middle daughter, nine years old at the time, was abducted on December 26, 1974, and witnessed the sexual molestation of her friend. No suspects were ever found in the case, but both children were found. This seems really strange and coincidental. If these types of things usually point to a family member, how closely was Bill investigated? So another Redditor here posted an interview with Jill McReynolds, the McReynolds' daughter, who was the one who was uh, kidnapped and, and watched the molestation of her friend by the perpetrator. Now, in the interview, the podcast is Listen Carefully. Uh, this is an interview with Jill McReynolds. I don't see, it just says S01. Uh, this was posted February 22nd, 2021. So relatively recently. Uh, so other than S01, I don't see podcast numbers here. But the name of this podcast is Listen Carefully, an in-depth analysis on the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey by Sam and Lindsay. And this is interview with Jill McReynolds, the man behind the beard. In a very special episode of Listen Carefully, Sam and Lindsay welcome their first guest, Jill McReynolds, daughter of suspect Bill McReynolds. She discusses her father's legacy of goodness while talking about how the Jean Benet case affected her family and her father's well-being. So, not Jill Ren McReynolds' fault, but the interviews here, I mean, you have to have a high tolerance for brown nosing and softball questions to really be able to get through this podcast, I actually listened to just about the whole thing. Uh, it, it was difficult. Again, not nothing to do with Jill McReynolds, not her fault in any way, but these interviewers, it was just really, really rough to get through. She offers pretty much nothing. She doesn't directly answer any questions to the, to the pertinent evidence. She does not address her own ordeal. Again, not blaming her in any way. I'm sure that was very traumatic. But she really doesn't offer anything in terms of suspects who did it or any other information. I'll play a short little clip regarding how she wrote off Santa's special gift. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Um, we're really looking forward to kind of getting a, a look at what your father was really like instead of how the media improperly portrayed him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same same with your mom as well. Um, like we've discussed before, Lindsay and I are, you know, big researchers of this case. And the fact that Bill McReynolds and Janet McReynolds keep coming up um, as these like kind of gotcha journalism stories mm -hmm. has always really irked me. And 
just recently on Facebook, there was an article circulating and the, the title of it was Father Christmas and the Maid, the Forgotten Suspects. Mm. <laughs> How are they forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they, they've ever been forgotten. No, they still get brought up all the time. And, you know, and of course, in the true crime world, your father is best known as Santaville. Mm -hmm. And we always read a lot of stories about him being the town Santa and playing Santa at the Ramsey's Christmas parties. But how would you describe him? Well, that's a big, long story. Luckily, I have had a lot of time to think about it. <laughs> so I'm just going to call him Bill um, when I explain who he is. But... Um, but I wanted to preface that with just saying that, you know, for the last 20 years of his life, he was Baba to us because my, my, my son, when he was a toddler, started calling him that. Aww. So he was Baba, but we'll just use Bill because it's a little less confusing, I think. <laughs> to explain Bill, I'll have to go all the way back to the beginning. So he and, and my mom were both born in uh, rural, the rural South. They both grew up desperately poor. My dad had a sister, an older sister, who died of polio when he was seven. So that really just affected his life. Like, that was a huge loss for him. His dad subsequently left the family, abandoned him and his mom. He started working when he was 12 to help support his mom. And he worked his whole life after that. But he was also just one of the really exceptional kind of people that super overachiever, like on top of working, he also just excelled in school, in high school. He was like the editor of the school newspaper and he was president of the Glee Club and graduated right at the top of his class. And he won a scholarship to go to college. And he and my mom were both this is just blows my mind to think about like he and my mom were both the very first people of all the people that have been here in America and my lineage um, since 1737 to go to college. Wow. Yeah. My dad just worked, worked, worked all through college, paid his way to live and go to college. And, you know, not only to just to go to college, but to graduate school, get a master's get a PhD, like both of my parents did that. And to me, that's just blows, blows my mind. Like, it, So I didn't realize he was so educated. That's amazing. Oh yeah. Did you know he was a journalism professor? No, I, I didn't know that. Um, I, I'm really impressed by his qualifications though. Oh my God. This, you know, what happened to Bill McReynolds with the John Bonet case? Could not have happened to a more, it's, it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> he sounds like a kind and brilliant man. Stranger than fiction in life. Like he was, he was very brilliant. And my mom was the smartest person I've ever met. She was a smart lady. And yeah. was she a film critic? Um, that's what some of the internet theories claim about your mother. Yeah, she sure was. She was a, a film and theater critic all through um, the 70s. Yeah, that's yeah. a cool job. That was a really cool job. So she had a, uh, a column in the Daily Camera and went to plays all the time and was very selective about the movies that she reviewed. Like they were kind of like the more obscure artsy kind, you know, not, not the necessarily the popular culture kind. But not like Dirty it, Harry. No, no <laughs> Dirty Harry or Ransom in my <laughs> repertoire of columns because... That's not the kind of columnist she was. She was more like the Roger Ebert of Boulder, you know? <laughs> like the artistic films and... Yes, yes. Yeah, so that's how she got into playwriting. Did they both have PhDs? They both had PhDs. See, that is something I, I never knew. And I really wish that instead of people referring to him as Santa Bill, they could at least put you know, Dr. Doctor. McReynolds. Yes, right? Yeah, for how hard he had to work for his qualifications. It's just like completely disregarded in so many articles. Well, in every article, I think. Every article, essentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of hard to find 
you know, much about either of your parents as, as who they were as people mm -hmm. um, in terms of their goals, careers, aspirations, or even being as caretakers in your family. It's mostly just like you, like we talked about before, those two big coincidences that people tend to really grasp onto. Mm -hmm. um, and that yeah. would be the play that was written yeah. by your mother and hey, also... Rude. Also for the fact that I was kidnapped and sexually abused on the same day as Jean Benet Ramsey, only Which, only twenty two years earlier. That's such a horrific coincidence, and I'm really sorry that happened. And I'm sorry that that was even like so publicized. And it's just such a in, insane coincidence. But yeah, it, yeah. Well, don't worry about it. It's like you know. Every now since me too, like pretty much everybody's come out and their moms have come out as being victims of sexual abuse. So I have no idea how that information ever surfaced. I just wanted to explain that, you know, their early background just because I think it kind of explains Bill in terms of my parents were just sort of like, in a way, they were sort of like immigrants. You know, like, like they came into the middle class, they, but you know, they had no history or background, but they moved up into the middle, middle class, you know, academic life. But I think my dad probably always experienced what we would call imposter syndrome now. Like he just had to, because, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's things, there's things you don't know when you're not part of a certain class, like little mannerisms or little, you know, subtle body language that I don't think he ever really understood very well or my mom I don't think he ever they ever really were terribly accepted because they weren't they weren't just weren't quite there if that makes sense yeah and, it sounds like they didn't act like typical like you know middle class or mm -hmm. like how you might expect when you're saying like nuances yeah mm -hmm. but they they really tried you know they really like our house was full of classic literature and they loved to listen to classic music and, you know, like they, uh, they really thought that that was it, you know, that was being not a, not a poor person anymore. Really important. And, um, and also like, I can't emphasize this enough. My dad was a journalist, like he believed in real journalism, like from, you know, really young age, I can remember being told like, always look at both sides of the story always find out all the facts like he really idolized journalism he really he was a very idealistic person and he really idealized hard investigative journalism like you know he was a big Andrew, edward r murrow fan and a big he was uh, acquaintances with molly ivins and those were like his heroes like <laughs> do you think he felt you know, slightly betrayed by his passion in terms of like how these journalists portrayed him. Absolutely. Absolutely. He was just devastated because like he, he had had some inklings before he retired. He just, you know, was starting to feel like really uncomfortable about things happening in journalism with like cable news and the internet was just starting to get going and Social media hadn't really happened yet, but it was, you know, there were things starting and there was a lot of hype going on and he, he didn't like that. Like, he did not like that. And so after he retired, he was really all about having fun. You know, he just wanted to That's have great. fun. He'd been working his whole life and just yeah. wanted to play and do, do what he loved. And enjoy so, his retirement. Yeah. So what kind of stuff did he do? Well, before I tell you, kind of that piece, I just wanted to say that um, what happened to him when all of this came out sensationalizing, like absolutely like shattered his sense of self, I think in a lot of ways. Like if you're, um, you know, a psychology in psychotherapy talk, it's, uh, it's called a schema fracture. When, you know, your view of the world just kind of gets turned upside down. And, and so that's what happened to him. And he never really recovered from that. Like he was just heartbroken, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. I imagine that had, you know, a huge effect on your whole family. Yeah, well, 
Definitely, but you know, mostly on him because he was an idealistic, sentimental, foolish kind of old man. You know, yeah, he really, really believed in goodness, and uh, it wasn't hype. Like he, he really was like tried to be like the embodiment of what Santa is. You know, right? <laughs> and his, you know. So anyway, getting back to like what what he was like outside, you know, after retirement, and he he got the white beard just kind of as part of. You know, he was very, um, he wasn't a, a religious person at all, but he was a very spiritual person. He really believed in, you know, goodness. And uh, so he was really involved in the Unity Church. Um, oh, okay. I don't know if you know about it, but, it, you know, it's sort of like this, all religions put together, like Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, like all just kind of mixed together with the idea that love, God, or whatever you want to call it, is inside of you. So that was just like a really big piece of his life and what I think he kind of took into his Santa <laughs> career. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there there are articles, you know, prior to JonBenet's death about Santa Bill. You know, it sounds mm -hmm. like everyone... Uh, in the community knew who he was and loved him and oh yeah uh, he was like he he had his moment and claim to fame as being Santa because <laughs> he ended up being really good at it yeah and I think he was so surprised by that because you know when he was a kid like there was no Christmas he never had Christmas as a kid so Christmas wow. is special special for him and uh and so you know he just was having the time of his life as Santa he he probably would have been Santa Bill for the rest of his life if he could have and yeah that's one of the real sad things is that getting to finally do what you wanted to do after all those years of hard work and just to have it just ripped out of his you know just ripped away from him like you know he never got to play Santa ever again it was very sad to witness him going through that and I wanted to share a few things about leading up to the the murder um for one thing, he did have very serious open heart surgery just a few months before the murder. He was, you know, almost died. He, he had some really serious complications. He was, he lost like, he was in the hospital for like over a month. He lost like 40 pounds. He was frail mm -hmm. and he was not in good health. Um, that is absolutely true. And he wasn't traipsing around doing Santa stuff. Mm -hmm. On, on, in 1996, he was, you know, just not even able to lift 20 pounds at that point because um, he was still, you know, trying to recover. And um, the only things he did as far as his Santa, Santa stuff that, that winter is like he did, um, he did the Ramsey party and he did, there was a special that was being um, created uh, about it was Charles Kuralt on the road that was like a you know show they had on TV then and, and uh, it was like a national television show and they were going around and finding real Santas in the country right <laughs> you know profiling the real Santas and so my dad was picked as one of the real Santas and <laughs> what an honor <laughs> yeah that there was, was like a black Santa and you know this Santa cool. and that Santa but so anyway, that's the only thing he did for Santa. Was he did, he did the Charles Kuralt video, which I don't think was ever released, as far as I know, it was never released. And he went to the Jean Benet Ramsey Christmas party because he was the kind of person that would go out of his way for a friend. You know? To a fault, even sometimes, no. yeah. I mean, obviously, <laughs> that was a big wow. mistake he made with going to that party. <clears throat> he should have been home in bed, but, um, you know, that's just the kind of person he was. He would, if he thought you were a friend, he would, he would go out of his way, out of his comfort zone to help and be there. And, and I think that was just a, a huge misunderstanding that he had. He really believed that the Ramseys were his friends. God. Yeah, I can I can answer a few questions if you want about the glitter and the node and all that stuff because I can have some explanations for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that would be really interesting. That actually um, wasn't even in our list of questions, um, but that actually would be really interesting because that is something that always comes up in documentaries. They're like, 
they make it sound super suspicious that he had this glitter right. from Jean Benet, and it's just like, oh, like okay. oh, he must have been obsessed with her. He took the glitter into the surgery with him, and right, that was so like so out of context. So if you put it in context, what what do people go? What do people take with them when they go into surgery when they're not sure if they're going to live or not? Good luck, Charlie. Could, could have easily not made it out of that surgery. So he took with him the thing that represented what he loved most in life. The reason to live is to like do what you want to do, do what makes you happy. You know, I think that's what the glitter represented to him. Yeah, being you know, Santa Claus, like, being free, being magic yeah, and special. Yeah. Magic, you know, make, doing good things in the world. That's that was his reason to live. Like, just happened to be that you know Jean Benet gave him that vial of glitter. Like, it wasn't about her; it was about him. Right. Well, and it sounds like your parents, too, are very poetic people. Very. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Such poetic. And as you say, Beautiful. idealistic. Too. Idealistic, yeah. Mm. Sweet. And what is more idealistic than, like, magic fairy dust? Or, you know? Exactly. So right. when, he, when he would stroll up and down the Boulder Mall, mm -hmm. he would, you know, my mom had her little basket with candy in it and little candy canes, and my dad had glitter. And so he would give the kids, you know, he'd have them hold out their hands and put a little glitter in their hands and say, this is, you know, this is angel dust. And he had this feel, you know, it was like his thing was, uh, how did it go? So angels are everywhere. Christmas is every day. And Santa is always in your heart. And that's what he would tell the kids and give them the, the you know, angel dust. And that's so cute. That's what the glitter was about. Oh my gosh, that is like just so magical, honestly. It really I, was, yeah. Yeah, can you imagine? Totally twisted out of, you know. Horribly so. I mean, can you imagine being a little kid and you meet Santa Claus and he gives you this magic angel dust and tells you, you know, Christmas is every day and it's just like seems so special and sweet. Yeah. And then... um you know, as far as like the, the letter that, uh, you know, was sent to the Ramses, like, like I said, like he really thought they were friends. And so he gave him a copy of his, a tape and a copy of this kid's book that he wrote called um, Santa's Special Gift or no, Santa's Simplest Gift is the name of his okay. book. And he made it into a tape with his voice, you know, it was like a kid's story. And, you know, he thought, he thought he was eulogizing Jean Benet, you know, by interviewing and telling everybody how great she was. Like, that was like Aww. a eulogy, you know? Like, that's what people do when you're, you know, you eulogizing somebody, right? They say, oh, they were the best person ever lived, you know? All that hyperbole because you want to make the parents feel good, right? Right. And she had become so high profile and you know, it's, he probably thought people were looking for an insight into who she really was. And, you know, he knew not the, you know, pageant queen that was flaunting around, but it sounds like he knew, you know, the little girl that is Jean Benet and was Jean Benet. Right. I think that's what he was, yeah, trying to convey. And I mean, people just took it the wrong way because maybe he was just a little bit too emotional. I think he was also eulogizing his, his sister in a way, too. Yeah, it, it's just amazing to me because, you know, out of context and the way the media really ran with this on all different directions and, and digging up information about you and your family. And, you know, he was, it sounds like at its very simplest form, he was just a guy who still believed in magic, right? Like he just wanted to spread cheer and be happy and, you know, live out his retirement the way he always wanted to. And, the speculations that believed. yeah just believe people you know? are good and you know yeah true and yeah. cared about the truth and right mm -hmm. but you know when you think about like people finding out stuff about us like obviously nobody found out very much they just barely scratched the surface of course, she doesn't mention that this gift would be given after Christmas, and this is not something given to a child for Christmas. And then, of course, she doesn't, uh, she basically says this could be said to any child, but clearly the amount of information ha we have here is that Bill McReynolds was 
regarded Jean Benet as very, very special, more special than his own kids. So in terms of his relationship with her. So unless he's, I mean, if he really does say that to every single kid and evidence can be provided and that's the control, then that's fine. That can be accounted for. But Jill clearly did not address that or account for it. So, but the other, the real takeaway from this podcast is if her parents were identity thieves, it seems like it must have had happened before her birth because she seems very genuine and not knowing anything about that. She seems, you know, to genuinely have nothing but love for her father. And uh, it's, again, it's very, very difficult to imagine that he really was complicit just by everything said about him. So he really could have just been an eccentric caught in a mess or who knows, again, this is mind shock, without knowing the actual outcome of the case, it's impossible to really know anything for sure. But yeah, she doesn't really offer anything other than that. And she does come off as completely genuine. So I think it's safe to say that if her father was involved with something, she has no knowledge of it. So that's pretty much the only thing we can really get from that. Again, I could be wrong about that too, but that's the impression that I got. So there are actually Longmont police records regarding the December 26, 1974 abduction of Jill McReynolds and her friend. Huh. And these are available on archive.org. A lot of redacteds in these documents, but... Wow. That is curious. Curious, curious. So comments on these documents... I noticed the name of the person reporting this was <laughs> presumably the mother of the girl molested. I have to say that I always thought the sexual assault was highly suspicious and that there might have been some connection between it and the assault and murder of Jean Bonnet, but looking at the details in the report, that does not seem all that likely. The attack was close to the victim's home and a long way away from Jill's. And it does actually look like it was kind of a random attack. But then again, you never know. I guess the guy could have been following Jill. It is a curious... Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's weird. So apparently Jill's parents never... So they weren't the ones that reported it. And another curiosity is that Jill supposedly was just forced to watch this assault on her friend and was not assaulted herself, according to all of this known information. A follow-up post here by Marion Number 1. I still think it could have very much been planned. Jill's grandmother's home was within walking distance, Janet's mother. And her own parents would likely have known the general area where she was. There are at least two major child abductions that come to mind. The kidnappings of Stephen Stainer in 1972 and Johnny Gosh in 1982 that appear random on the surface but were, in my view, orchestrated with the complicity of the parents. And there's something disturbing in the narrative of the report at the end of page 7. What the heck? I mean, this is very disturbing. I don't even really want to read this. This assaulter is just asking the girls these questions, and it's very, very disturbing. So this poster is alleging that Jill might have possibly been abused based on certain uh, actions and responses here, which, again, I, th I don't know if that those assumptions can be made because if she's scared, she might do whatever the abductor is saying. But apparently, yeah, this is this is terrible. Apparently, she was also made to comply with the abductor so it's not like she wasn't harmed at all huh one thing though it does seem like the local police really did try to investigate thoroughly and it was not a cover-up job that they didn't ever find out who the guy was mind you that might have all taken place higher up later on there wasn't overt evidence of a cover-up feels to me like leads were follow-up followed up poorly at the very least and perhaps intentionally so the suspect discussed on pages two to four had his car adamantly identified by one of the girls and tentatively identified by the other even though he had an alibi that seemingly checked out though initially the police claimed it didn't then they claimed there was a miscommunication with the man's employer and they were told about the 27th instead of the 26th 
which is possible but still an odd mistake, and neither girl identified him. That doesn't mean that someone couldn't have been using his car. It doesn't seem like he was even asked about where his car was or who else might have had access to it. And, of course, the potential red flags. Okay. Wow. Huh. All very, very weird. Very weird and disturbing. Very, very disturbing. Um, yeah, I don't know what to make about that. 